The average working Briton will spend over 90,000 hours of their lives at work. That's 12,000 work days. When you look back over your careers, how many will you remember fondly? Not enough? That'll be the answer for many. Stress, burnout, and other impacts of work on our well-being are on the rise. But it doesn't have to be that way. You may be among the minority of people who really love their jobs, but it is a minority of us, and I want to help change that. A few years ago, I completed some psychometric testing to tell me my preferred conflict resolution style, and cooperative came out on top, which I was really pleased with. But hot on its heels, my next highest score was competitive. Now, this really threw me. It's honestly not how I saw myself. <laughs> it uh, didn't strike me as a particularly positive attribute to have when it came to conflict resolution at work. And uh, I did feel a little defensive. I even mentioned it to some of my colleagues. A few days later, a high-performing member of my team came to ask me for some support. Let's call her Rupee. A senior manager had emailed Rupee, criticizing her work. The feedback was curt, it lacked empathy, and Rupee was visibly upset. Now, although I remained outwardly composed and calm as Rupee told me about this, inside, I was really quite angry. I was determined that as Rupee's line manager, I would support her to resolve this conflict, and in doing so, she would regain her previous confidence in her abilities. <sighs> I'm telling you this from sharing this story about myself because it tells you a little something about me. You see, at work, I'm almost perpetually preoccupied with the well-being of my colleagues, their health and their happiness. I love the idea that as a leader, I can support people in the workplace to thrive. But that idea alone isn't enough for me. I'm doing my PhD in work psychology so that I can test my theory in order to measure my impact empirically and ultimately to enable others to do the same. And I'm really excited about spending the next six years of my life making that happen. But six years is a long time, right? What am I here to talk to you about today? Well, we all know that our leaders have a significant ability at work to support us to be happy and healthy, right? But how many of us have worked for a leader who thought they were great at supporting their team to thrive? when our experience being in that team was somewhat different. One of the key factors here is perception. Allow me to illustrate. I want you all to reflect for a moment on what you think makes someone a great leader. Society tells us that certain attributes are preferable. Think superhero movies, Superman, Black Panther, Wonder Woman, Captain America, Shang-Chi, I imagine you're thinking of qualities like charisma, confidence, decisiveness, courage. Now, does this list change for you at all when you think again about a leader who specifically invests in the health and happiness of their teams? Let's take charisma as an example. It's generally considered to be a positive leadership attribute, and many people will work harder for someone who builds rapport in this way. You may be one of those people. I certainly have been. So would it surprise you to know that there is emerging evidence of a relationship between the charisma of our leaders and staff burnout? It's perfectly natural to want to do more for someone who you like, but it's not necessarily a good thing if it comes at the cost of your health. Now, I don't know about you, but I wonder how many of our charismatic leaders are aware of this potential consequence of their otherwise excellent leadership quality. Some people prefer a more understated leader, one who may not thrive on the stage, but can be relied upon to respond to your emails. In this environment, a person may feel more able to be authentically themselves and accepted for that because they can choose to communicate in a way that feels most comfortable to them. And this leader is unlikely to put pressure on them to manufacture charisma 
if it's not in their nature. I'm not saying that charisma is a bad trait in a leader. The point I'm making is that these things are open to interpretation and that even if you think you know what great leadership looks like, further evidence may encourage you to rethink. Now, if that's the case, if good leadership is open to interpretation, then how do we separate the good from the bad so we can all move forward together? The truth is, I don't believe that we can. There are too many variables, too many ways in which our skills and experiences, our behaviours can be interpreted differently. My idea is that our leaders' ability to support us to thrive at work rests on the quality of their self-awareness. In other words, their ability to understand how their behaviours are experienced by others. Let's return to my story to illustrate this further. You'll recall we left our hero, that's me, <laughs> blazing at the injustice of an unpleasant email received by their teammate, Rupi. I'm pleased to tell you that steps were taken and the situation was resolved to everyone's satisfaction. And a short while later, Rupi came to offer me some feedback. Rupi told me that she'd been reflecting on how uncomfortable I'd felt when I realised that I might be perceived as competitive at work. Now, she realised, although she said that at the time the description hadn't resonated with her, she'd been thinking about situations in which my own interests were at stake. However, having worked with me to resolve her conflict, she'd since decided, concluded, that my competitiveness came to the fore when the well-being of my teammates came under threat. And then she thanked me and it felt amazing. Remember how composed and calm I'd been when Rupi told me that she was upset? Yeah, well, it turns out I hadn't been quite as collected as I thought I'd been. Rupi had clearly perceived my, my anger and my competitiveness rising through my supposedly calm professional demeanour. My, uh, my dad actually has uh, a name for this particular trait. He calls it tone of face. <laughs> uh, it is in fact a most endearing family quality. <laughs> but you know, at work, maybe something for me to reflect on. The upshot of all of this is that Rupi's experience of my behaviour changed how she saw me as a leader. And because she chose to share this feedback with me, my own light bulb moment came when I realised that I could be competitive at work and consistent with my values. My understanding of what made a good leader had changed and my self-awareness had improved thanks to Rupi's feedback. So, quick recap. Our perceptions at work may differ from those around us, they can change over time. Feedback is one of the things that will change them. And our leader's ability to support us to be happy at work rests on the quality of their self-awareness. Or, put another way, where a leader has poor self-awareness, a perception gap exists between themselves and their colleagues. Now this is all well and good, but why should you care, right? Because, put simply, the greater the perception gap, the worse a leader will be at supporting their team to thrive at work, regardless of how hard they try to achieve this. Now, this last point is really important. Even if a leader wants desperately to support their team to be happy and healthy at work, and they try really hard to make that happen, without good self-awareness, and a narrow perception gap, they're unlikely to be success successful. Now, we've already touched on the solution to this problem, haven't we? So let's just train all of our leaders to be receptive to feedback. <laughs> As I'm sure you've anticipated, I'm afraid it's not quite that simple. Our leaders need our help. They can't do this alone. Even if the leader wants to 
improve the well-being of their work, so the well-being of their teammates at work, and they're willing to work with us on this. Their self-awareness will only ever be as good as the quality of the feedback that you choose to share with them. And that means that if you want to thrive at work, your boss will need your help, and they may not even know it. So what can you do? Well, personally, I think we're all leaders. We all have skills and experience that mean people look to us in different aspects of our lives at work. But I do want you to take a moment to reflect on where you see your role in the workplace. Are you a leader? Do you work for one? Maybe you're both. And now, let's talk about giving and receiving feedback. So, leaders, be courageous and invite feedback from those around you. Do this consistently and try to manage your reactions so as not to appear defensive. Remember, tone off face. Even if you disagree with what you hear, remember it's not about being right or wrong, but about having the opportunity to understand how your behaviours are experienced by others so that you can decide whether or not you want to change them. And everyone, please offer your leaders feedback. Be sensitive when you do so. And if you're nervous about a strong power dynamic or worried of, that you may appear overly critical, you could try giving them some positive feedback to reinforce a behavior you want them to repeat. It, it's a lot easier. Most importantly, remember that the more willing you are to be open about what you need to thrive at work, the more likely that your leader will be able to support you to achieve this. Now I know, I know that giving and receiving feedback takes courage. But I also believe that learning to live with that anxiety is well worth the rewards. And I promise you, the more you do it, the easier it will become. But I do want to take a moment to recognize my privilege in this context. You see, I'm confident using my voice to share my perspective because I'm used to that voice being heard, understood, and responded to. And I know that that is not the lived experience for many. So it's relatively easy for me to tell you all to share feedback at work. I do know that that will be harder for some than for others. I don't wish to oversimplify what I know is a complex and entrenched issue, but I will say this. I am a leader and I welcome your feedback. I want to know what you need from me to thrive at work. I know that I'm not alone. And the truth is, even if you feel uncomfortable sharing feedback at work, you're probably doing so already, just subconsciously. And if that's the case, wouldn't it be better to be deliberate, to do everything you can in your power to maximize your opportunity of working somewhere that you feel truly happy? I don't know about you, but I think that's too good an opportunity to miss. So there's been a lot for you to take in there. But what I want you to decide is how you're going to put my idea into action and be your own positive disruptor. I wonder if some of you are thinking, yeah, absolutely, next week when I'm back in work. And that's great. It really is. But I have a challenge for you. There's been a theme running through my talk today, courage. And I want you to be courageous and take the first step here, today. There's a break coming up soon. Why not use it to approach someone new and offer them some positive feedback? Maybe one of the speakers that you've seen on the stage today. And if you're nervous, come and find me. I promise you, I'm an absolute delight. <laughs> I'll even go first. You've been a great audience, and you've made this a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. <laughs>